because it made me go back to like, dude, two and a half years ago, you were incarcerated. Like now you're a director. Like is like, how did you, how did you make this happen? Like, are you, are you fit? Frankly, like, and, and mm. but on, on one level, like I know I put in the work. I know that my drive and passion and what I've been able to do thus far is what they saw and they wanted to reward that. And they're like, well, this dude's more than just a call counselor. Like he can do, he can do more for this company than, than just that. Um, so I know that on one hand, but it's still like, I've never had anything. I've never been in any position remotely close to this. And I'm still only two and a half years released from prison where I was, you know, made to feel, you know, this big. Repeat after me. I bring more than diversity. I bring irreplaceable perspectives. Hey friends, my name is Whitney and I'm the host of Impostrix Podcast, the show that validates professionals of color navigating imposter syndrome and racial toxicity in their career. Join us and be validated. You got this. Welcome back to Impostrix Podcast. I am looking forward to this conversation. Um, with Mr. Martin Lockett, we are talking about intersectionality of being a person of color, um, of navigating the career space, but then also of dealing with additional challenges like what Mr. Lockett has experienced, which is that of being someone who's been incarcerated. I think really the experiences and the identities that people have to take on after incarceration um, is really, really complex. And I would love, love, love to just learn more about your experience with it, Martin. Um, so I'm going to let you introduce yourself, um, and thank you for joining us on the show. Well, thank you so much for having me, Whitney. Um, and yes, we can definitely dive into the complexities around, um, you know, identity and self-concept and uh, post-prison and, and integration into society. But before all that, again, let me introduce myself. Uh, so my name is Martin Lockett. I am currently the Director of Cultural Engagement at Lines for Life, based out of Portland, Oregon, which is a nonprofit organization um, centered on um, uh, mental health awareness and uh, substance use treatment uh, resources. Um, and so I am also a person in recovery uh, from alcoholism uh, coming up on 20 years here in the next few weeks. And I am also a clinician. Um, I work with um, folks privately, actually through in uh, uh, a company down in Atlanta, Georgia, um, where they get referrals for clients. And so um, I'm a public speaker as well. I don't want to go on and give myself 20 different titles, but these are these are things that are central um, in my life. And, and, and um, they are part of my mission and my purpose and my passion. So I think it's important that I kind of give voice to those things. We're all for the titles here because, like, I don't know, if we're not going to give ourselves the titles, then other people might not. So that's all I'm to say. Um, and you also, do you identify as a Black person? Very much so, yes. That is, I, I should have said that first. I'm uh, <laughs> definitely a proud Black man. Um, so, yes. Awesome. Cool, cool. Um, and so you have been incarcerated before correct? Yes. I've actually, uh, I was, I was incarcerated twice. Um, I did uh, about three and a half years at the age of 19 for an armed robbery that I committed with uh, some of my high school buddies. Um, I, I didn't physically go in and hold a gun to anybody, but I was the quote unquote mastermind to it. So mm -hmm. I like drew up the, the, the blueprint of what the place looked like because I used to work there. And anyway, I set, I set them up to be robbed. So we all went down for that. Mm -hmm. And then um, two years after my release, I then went back for 17 and a half years for DUI manslaughter, um, where I was the um, the cause of two deaths and another person being severely injured um, in a car crash on New Year's Eve of 2003. Oh, wow. So we're coming up on the... I guess when this episode is aired, it'll be afterwards, but we're recording right now in mid-December and we're coming up on that anniversary. Yes, we are. Um, I just spoke, I was just in Oregon um, the last 11 days and I, I had the opportunity to speak at a DUI victim impact panel 
um, in Oregon. And so it being this close to the anniversary was really significant because these are first and second and even third time DUI offenders in those um, in those rooms. And I got to tell my story, um, obviously, with the, the greatest, you know, um, uh, caution to not, you know, find yourself behind the wheel this New Year's Eve or Christmas Eve or just during this holiday season, especially mm-hmm. when we know, you know, more crashes happen. Um, and to use my story as an example of what can happen uh, when you subject yourself to that. Yeah. So I think most listeners know at this point that I am also somebody that's in recovery. Um, it'll be 11 years in February. And um, so I have very intimate knowledge of where alcoholism can take you and how um, ruled by alcohol uh, people can be. And I can't fathom having to live with the reality of taking the life of somebody else under the influence of alcohol. And I'm really grateful um, that for me, I didn't have that consequence. Um, And I would love to know from you what, you know, how that's changed your life, how having that DUI and being involved um, in this fatal wreck um, while you were drunk, presumably, um, how that has impacted your life? Well, that was that was the beginning of, of everything that led to, to where I am today, frankly. You know, when this happened, I was 24 years old. I knew because I had already been in trouble with the law. So I was very aware of the laws in Oregon. And Oregon is one of the last states. And I know people think that Oregon is so liberal and, you know, love to hug trees and eat granola and, you know, naked bike rides. And all that may be true to some degree, but they are one of the um, the most uh, strict, um, you know, uh, states when it comes to to to, to criminal law. So um, they have mandatory minimum sentencing for any person to person violent crime, and a DUI manslaughter is considered a person to person violent crime, just as though I had you know shot somebody and they died, and maybe I plead guilty to manslaughter. DUI manslaughter is no different. They each carry mandatory minimum 10 years day for day. And so I knew when I had two deaths on my hands and then another guy being severely injured, which is another person to person assault is, is, is how it's classified. I knew I was looking at 20 years in prison day for day. So um, it was obviously the lowest point of my life. And then obviously being responsible for two innocent lives, right? And clearly not operating in my right faculties and and all of that because, you know, I was three times over the limit when they drew my blood that night. Mm. I was 0.24. And this was an hour and a half or so after the crash, which means it was higher at the time of the crash. I had been drinking all day. But I did this every day in my addiction because I had deluded Mm. myself into thinking that my life was manageable because I had a a decent job. I was moving up in the company. I was going to community college in the evening um, with aspirations of becoming a nurse. I paid my bills. I moved out of my parents' house at 22 and lived with my girlfriend in Vancouver, Washington. And so there were a lot of things that I could point to in my life to say, well, it's you're not that bad, Martin. Like yeah. you're not that guy under the bridge with a with a paper bag and a forty. You know what I mean? So, um, so that was the delusion that I lived under in my addiction, right? And so this happens. I know I'm going to prison for almost two decades. I have no idea how to make sense of what just happened. I just know that like I am royally blanked. Like I this like there's no way out of this. So three days later, I'm in my cell, minding my business. I get the Oregonian newspaper. Somebody slid it underneath my door. I have no idea why I'm getting this paper. I I, I thumb through it. I see my picture on the front page of one of the sections. And each paragraph that I read that morning, the the lives of my victims start to unfold. Mm -hmm. And I learned that these people were active in their recovery journeys. They had like 16 and 17 years 
clean, respectively. They were volunteers with, with, with Volunteers of America. They were volunteers with Mothers Against Drunk Driving. They would watch women's children so that these ladies could attend AA and NA meetings. Like they were all about recovery. They yeah. were wow. literally returning home from a clean and sober New Year's Eve party the night that this happened when they were struck and killed by a drunk driver. And so the columnist had talked about, he called it a palpable irony that these people who had given their lives to this cause would have their lives cut short by a drunk driver, the exact mm -hmm. person they were trying to help. And then he says something at the end that, that, that changed my life forever and, and set me on this, on this course that I've been on for the last 20 years. He said, perhaps the person they will have ended up helping the most is the man who's charged with killing them. And it was such a profound statement in the moment. Again, I'm 24 years old. I know I'm going to prison for almost two decades. So I couldn't fully appreciate, you know, how this situation was going to help me. But I also knew that I had to figure it out, right? I had to figure out how I was going to apply that statement to my 24 year old life. And so I just, I got, you know, meditative and, and, and spiritual. Mm -hmm. And, and then it finally dawned on me that, the only way this tragedy will not be in vain is if I carry on these people's legacies. If I literally make my life mission to be all about helping those who are struggling in their addiction. First of all, I need to learn about my own addiction and where mm -hmm. it started and why it started the way it did and all the circumstances around it. Because nobody in my family was an alcoholic or, you know, an addict or, you know, I was the only one. So, um, so once I decided that I was going to make this my, 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 my life's purpose, then I had to get educated and learn about addiction and things like that. So that was, that was kind of the origin of where this, where this path started for me. Um, yeah. Which wow. started from a, a great tragedy. So that was, that was the jump off. Yeah. Yeah. That was, that was definitely it. So, um, so I get this, I take a deal, a plea bargain rather, for 17 and a half years, a few months later, uh, day for day. So I knew my my behavior in prison would not change my sentence one way or the other. I could get in a fight every other day and still get out 17 and a half years later. Or I could okay. never get into a fight and never have a write-up, which is what happened. I never had a write-up. I never went to the whole segregation. Um, never had any issues. And But my sentence was set. In Oregon, it is set. So 210 months is what I did day for day. And, um, but I was, I was, I was mission focused. I was mission driven. So I, I get to mm. prison. I, I take at the time they were offering community college courses. I take one class per term. Um, they were charging us 25 bucks per class. It was through this, this, this program that was set up by these retired teachers. And, um, because you know, there's no federal fund. Well, there is now as of 2023, but since the crime bill was passed in 1995, when they want to be harsh on crime, it took away all the federal funding for those who are incarcerated to get an education beyond the GED. So, um, so this program was available. I took a few classes. Subsequently, I lost my father, uh, about three years into my sentence mm. because that happened. I was able to secure funding through his, um, his pension and, and life mm. insurance policies to be able to take classes from like Louisiana state university and Indiana university and Colorado. So I'm starting to take all these distance education courses, psychology, sociology, starting to unravel the layers of, of my addiction and, 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 uh, you know, negative behavioral patterns that started at age 14 and poor self-esteem and low self-concept and, uh, identity issues. I mean, just all of it, right. The psychosocial yeah. dynamics that we go through during life, um, that without direction and structure can really put you on a bad, on a bad course. And that's what happened to me. And so I parlay all of that, um, into a master's degree, a master's in psychology, um, that I got in 2016 while I was still in, and I'm starting to mentor young guys coming in the system. And, um, and that was really, really rewarding for me. And then I, um, went into a seven month long treatment program at the prison 
And that's when I learned the difference between sobriety and recovery. I thought I had been in recovery this whole time because I hadn't drank in like 12 years. But I learned that, well, no, abstinence is not recovery, dude. It just means you haven't you haven't touched the substance yet. Yeah. Which I mean, good for you, you know. Right, right. But how's your soul feeling? Right, right. So um, so yeah, so I, I learned all these skills and I learned the biopsycho social spiritual model of recovery and how to really build a lifestyle um you know in in recovery that is meaningful and purposeful and fun because so many people think you can't have fun <laughs> being sober and i thought that frankly and that was one of yeah. the worries i had before Absolutely. i got out you know um so anyway so i pour all this energy into into mentoring other guys and I, I get clinical hours as a as a um as a mentor in the program after i graduated it uh, I get clinical hours toward a certification as a recovery mentor, and then the following year got certified as a as a substance abuse counselor in Oregon. And so, um, yeah, that was that was uh, kind of how I spent my time and and made it and made it meaningful and allowed me to live up to the vow that I made to those family members yeah. at sentencing that I would spend the rest of my life honoring their loved ones that I had taken. Um, by doing this work and preventing, hopefully preventing other people from following in my footsteps. Right. Wow. Um, so much of what you said there uh, resonates with me at some at some level or another, and I, I appreciate you sharing that with us. Um, because one of the things that you know, I think certainly I wonder as somebody not in prison. Um, but also as somebody that's assisted people in like creating reentry plans and figuring out basically what they're going to do next, you know, particularly when there's such a long time that you've spent in prison, um, it's hard to get back into the thing that you were doing that you were interested in. And even yourself, you're talking about initially that you had been studying to become a nurse, mm -hmm. um, and then like life happens um, and I, you know, life, life continues on the outside and it continues on the inside. And I'm, I know that, you know, on the inside people um, just like on the outside have different, uh, I don't know, just they change, you know, sometimes we change for the better. Sometimes we change for the worse, uh, but our interests change, our passions change. Um, and it sounds like for you, you know, learning more about these people and this very traumatic circumstance, um, but learning about what their mission was really gave you a little bit of fire to be able to then put all of you into something that was going to be positive moving forward. Absolutely, Whitney. You know, for, for many of us, so we know that statistics show that about 80% of those who are incarcerated state and federally have some involvement with drugs and or alcohol, whether it be they were intoxicated at the time of their arrest or they admitted that they struggled with substance use or they were in the commission of a crime trying to get money to get. So 80 percent. And yet we know that only about five percent, at least in Oregon, only five percent of those who are incarcerated. Actually, now they just passed a bill that's going to expand treatment. But when I was incarcerated mm -hmm. for all those years, about 5% of those um, uh, actually had access to a treatment program within the prison system. So so when we are in our addiction, obviously, um, you know, our, our, our psychosocial development is, is stunted. We, our emotional development is stunted, right? We're, mm. we're not processing our feelings. Uh, we're trying to suppress our feelings, frankly, with the, with the drugs and the alcohol, uh, for many of us. So when you are in prison, um, and, and, and when you don't have access to those resources, you're right. Some people change for the better or they change for the worse, whatever, whatever the case, they're trying to figure themselves out. Right. Apart from substances and apart from, uh, you know, the crimes that they were committing and apart. I mean, it's really you, you reshape your identity for better or worse, because some guys or ladies will, you know, they'll link up with the prison gangs and that becomes their mm -hmm. identity and 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 the prison politics and the culture. And that's that become and that is that is how institutional institutionalization sets in. Right. When you adopt a whole different framework for how you operate, 
that works in prison, there may be some advantages to that, right? Whether it be your part of a gang that's extorting these guys and so you're getting more commissary every month or you're still finding ways to manipulate the staff to get certain, you know, uh, better jobs and things like that. Like there, it, it does have its advantages. But if that becomes who you are, you get out of prison, that's not going to fly out here. That is not a way to reintegrate successfully in society. Thus, people find themselves going back within you know six months to a year. Or you can sit with yourself, because I sat with myself almost every day and reflected, right? And thought about that 14-year-old, shy, in, uh, immature, uh, uh, wayward youth that I was. Like, I sat with and like, why did he feel that way? Why did he have such a strong need to belong? Why would he... Why was he willing to do anything anybody uh, wanted him to do just just for their acceptance of him? Right. And so um, and so that's what started to kind of shape my new identity. Honestly, Whitney, I had no idea what my purpose was in life. I had no aim. I had no sense of direction. And so, you know, we know that a lot of people will frankly gain uh, a lot of knowledge about themselves and and and, and kind of parlay that into a purpose in life when something really tragic or something really pivotal happens in their lives, right? It's a pivotal moment. And because it causes you to like reflect and to think and to like, you have to make sense of it somehow. Otherwise it'll just consume you. And so once, but once you make sense of that, that, that tragedy or that, that circumstance, that adversity, you know, because I don't think we just go through things for, for for no reason. I personally don't think that. I think there's always something to to ascertain from that really, really, really hard circumstance, right? A, an invaluable life lesson that we are supposed to use to carry us forward in a certain way, guide us in a certain way, help us to guide others. There's some purpose there, but it's on us to figure out what that is. And so that was the driving force uh, behind kind of the direction that I went was this tragedy and like you said connecting with these people's mission and and how they were you know living their lives and um and it gave me a sense of direction for for who i am and um and what i'm supposed to do with my life and that's that's beautiful um there's so many i hmm what am i trying to say one of the things that continues to surprise me about the life that we live is how we never know when a thing is going to impact us and how it's going to impact us. And it can be a small thing. It can be a huge thing. And, you know, before we started recording, I, I was telling Martin about how I kind of randomly moved to Georgia, um, but then literally three weeks after I moved to Georgia, I met the man who was going to be my husband. And, um, you know, all of the things that happen up until the point where I decide that I'm moving to Georgia and all the things that happened for him up until the point where he decides that he's moving to South Georgia. And, you know, it's just, it's one of those things. We, we don't have control over everything. We have control over very little, in fact. And, you know, part of my kind of growing as an individual is embracing and accepting what happens. Um, you know, whether or not I have control or not, it's just life is happening. Um, and just being accepting of the fact that life is happening um, is, is something that, you know, particularly in sobriety um, and in recovery has been something that allows me to kind of roll with the punches a little bit and find, you know, make lemonade out of, I mean, lemonade out of lemons, um, which is not, not a good analogy for your situation since these are lives, not lemons. But, um, you know, just being able to accept, accept responsibility, accept accountability for the things that we have had um, some control over and then like do the next thing. Um, has been really, really powerful for me as I've grown. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you hear the concept in, um, I think it's DBT, uh, is radical acceptance. If I, if I have mm. that right. 
Um, but basically, it's, I mean, and in and, 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 and AA and NA, it's, it's said, um, you know, a, a little differently in the serenity prayer, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, Grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. Uh, so I think, you know, just that, that, that radical acceptance of knowing that there are going to be a lot of things that are beyond your control, right? That, no matter what you do, um, those things are going to happen. But we do have total control over how we respond to that how we allow it to affect us. A lot of people think that when certain things happen, well, it's just going to like it's, anybody would take it really, really hard. And I'm not saying that that you're not going to take it hard, but like you also get to decide if you're going to kind of stay in that rock bottom moment, if you're just going to lay down in it and just like, you know, be utterly miserable in it and be self pitiful and all those things. Or if you're going to allow that to be kind of your springboard so like you said, that next step, right? Where do we go from here? So this terrible thing happened, maybe self-inflicted, maybe not. It happened. Now what? Right. For me, mm-hmm. it was I'm going to prison for 17 and a half years. There's nothing I can do about that. My fate is sealed. But how am I going to spend that 17 and a half years? I do have a choice in that. Right. My physical circumstances are not going to change for 17 and a half years. But I can change. Right. I can do some internal work. I can make this, you know, uh, more than just a tragedy. I get to decide that because mm-hmm. I could have gone to prison for 17 and a half years, lifted weights, played dominoes, played spades, you know, uh, uh, ate commissary, you know, I, and just bided my time. I was going to get out in 17 and a half years no matter what. But, you know, for me, I, I you know, I chose because it was imperative that I made sure I left prison a different person than the 24 year old wayward aimless you know kid frankly emotionally and 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 on a mature uh uh maturity wise uh, i needed to leave a, a different person than him and so mm-hmm. um that's what i committed to yeah so i want to talk now about like your transition into the workforce um and into the workforce in the free world um, because it's always, I mean, look, when we start a new job, whether it doesn't really matter kind of the level, if you will, um, of that job, there is always a lot to learn. Um, there's new people to get to know, there's new systems and processes to get to know. And, you know, that's a time where we may have a lot of self-doubt. Um, we may have fear we may, you know, have some some challenging emotions come up because this is a new thing. Um, and I don't I don't consider that to even be imposter syndrome. Like I, I consider that just to be we're starting a new thing and we're getting used to it. Um, but I would like to like learn from you about what your experience was integrating um, back into the workforce and learning how to become confident in your ability um, through whatever self-doubt that you may have had um, associated with being someone who has spent the last 17 and a half years in prison, um, being a black man uh, in, you know, in the industry that you're in. So can you share a little bit with us about that? Sure. Um, So yes, it's obviously a very overwhelming thing uh, to to reintegrate the workforce out here because prior to, to to going to prison, I worked at a warehouse, right? I mean, I worked at a food distributing warehouse. I, you know, drove around forklifts and and you know, so I was very you know very blue collar you know worker. Um, now I am a counselor and 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 now I'm a director. So I'll kind of talk about each 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 one. So when I got out in 2021, the summer of 21, it was just it was just a whole um, you know, task to reacclimate to society, like forget work, right? Like technology, 17 and a half years later, you know, um, our, 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 you know, uh, uh, social norms and, you know, we have, you know, uh, uh, bathrooms that are, that are, that are not, um, you know, sex uh, or gender specific. Right. And so, I mean, just, so like society is different politically, Things are just so crazy now versus in 2001, two, three, when I was last out. And so I had to adapt just kind of um, 
my worldview, frankly, um, to 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 kind of accept kind of this new world. And so and so I'm I'm navigating that, and it was very exhausting. I remember like the first three or four weeks that I was out and learning the new technology, and I got my phone and downloading apps and having to you know come up with a new password and use it. Like I didn't even have an email before I went into prison the first time. So like it was, I was literally starting from from from, wow. from ground zero with this, and so yeah. I remember the first three or four weeks, like at the end of the night, toward the end of the night, I was just so mentally drained, I was physically drained, exhausted, because I was taking in so much stimuli. Right in prison, everything is drab, the walls are 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 tan, uh, the officers wear gray and black, and we wear all blue. Like there's 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 not a lot of stimuli. And so I get out and I'm in the grocery store and there's, you know, bright colors and lights and, and kids running around and babies crying. And, um, you know, uh, just people, you know, it, it was like, it was, it was a lot to take in. And so, so there's that. Um, and so I made sure that I didn't want to try to take on work right away. I just wanted to have a mm-hmm. couple months and thankfully, Financially, I was okay because, like I said, when my dad passed away and he left, you know, we got money and stuff like that. So I was able to invest in some of my education and I had some when I got out. Um, so that put me in a better position than than most, frankly, getting out of yeah, prison, yeah. right, if I'm being honest. Um, so I didn't start work uh, until a couple months later. So I had my, my certification as a drug and alcohol counselor. So obviously, that's what I wanted to do. I applied on Indeed. Um, I got an interview. And it was important for me as as kind of scared as I was to talk about it. But like I had to come out in the first five minutes and say, look, this is where I've been for the last 17 and a half years. This is what happened because I because if I was going to work anywhere, like I needed them to accept me for who I am mm. and, and where I've been. And if you are a, a, a substance abuse um, treatment place, mental health, place, like you should value lived experience when it comes to peer mentors and counselors coming in to work for you because we connect best with people who are struggling honestly and so and so and they did and they were receptive now granted this is a portland based company so we know things are different in portland than they might be in louisiana you know what i mean or Mississippi, right? So, so let's just put that out there. So, I was successful at the interview. They offered me a remote position, which is great because for me, because of my crime, I can't drive until 2029. My license is revoked um, mm-hmm. until June of 2029. So, it was a remote position. I was able to take calls on the the line. So, it, it, for those who don't know, in Oregon, when you get cited, when you get stopped by the police, and you have a small amount of drugs uh pretty much any drug um you don't go to jail for it it's decriminalized you you call somebody like me or one of my colleagues and we do a screening with you over the phone and then we try to engage you on treatment resources and and offer them to you and things like that um so i did that for a couple years and because i was remote so there wasn't there wasn't going to the office and interacting with peers and things like that. So I think it kind of it, it could have very much shielded me from a lot of, you know, those kind of tough navigations that would have happened otherwise. Now, yeah. Grant, now having said that, I'll also say that um, I had, had conversations with the CEO and the COO and, you know, these chief clinical officers and directors and, you know, because we use teams uh, to communicate. Yeah. And mm-hmm. so. Like, truthfully, I felt supported. And I know this is this is not common, but I got to I got to be honest about my experience, yeah. which I know is probably in the minority for people who haven't done 17 and a half years and getting out, you know, but it's also different when you work in this field, I think. Right. Right. Versus like, say, go to work for a tech company or something like that. You know, you might it might might be a little more difficult. Um, so I was I was I was met with grace and I was met with. I say compassion and understanding. So frankly, that part wasn't so difficult. I will say, and we can talk about this now or, or a little bit later, uh, with the promotion uh, to director of cultural engagement. Now I'm in senior management. Um, and that's that's been, that's where my kind of self-doubt has 
crept in mm, and, and made me yeah. think like, well, am I worthy of this? And so I don't know if you want to go there now. But, yeah. But, okay. Yeah. I'd love to hear about that. And first, like the things I'm thinking about at the time when you were released and you started in the role um, taking calls, like that was during COVID, right? Yeah. Yeah. It was very much during so COVID. So I think, you know, maybe part of that also was was helpful for you um in the fact that i mean just thinking i'm thinking about like social anxiety really and you didn't use those words but in the difficulty that that sometimes folks have uh just in general with navigating spaces where we are needing to interact with people face to face or in close proximity or even going into the office and having to like say hi to people every day instead of just like not having to talk to anybody. Um, and so I was just thinking about how like the the time that that you were released and what the time was like then um, versus now. Uh, while there's still COVID out there, like we all out doing our things, you know, like <laughs> we are very much living the new normal as they say. And so um, it would to make sense to me just in terms of like the the physical and social um, part of working period across industries, um, you know, these days looks very different and is in ways more demanding um, than, than during COVID. Um, but yeah, I'm super interested to hear about like what, what you, what it's like now as a director. Um, yeah. Absolutely. And, 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 and I do want to go back cause you did make a point and, and I do want to say something about this as well, that, that even though, even though I wasn't physically showing up in these spaces, um, uh, with people and having to navigate that, like, because so for instance so so they paid me more than i thought i was i was going to get paid mm -hmm. and even making that money i sometimes question myself like like man like why are they paying me this 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 salary like i just got out of prison like certainly because I, in prison i had one of the top paying jobs and i was making 78 dollars a month and and like you know what i mean and so and so i'm questioning internally like do I really deserve this? Like what they're paying me? Like these people have been, mm -hmm. you know, they've never been to prison and they're, you know, making the same or maybe a little bit more, but like, so I had to like, accept that I literally had to like tell myself sometimes, Martin, like you deserve this. You've educated yourself. You, but like, cause for a while I'm like, but I, I still have this, 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 this uh, inmate identity. Right. Mm. Like I did, like I, that was my identity for 17 and a half years. So I always, I always knew my place when I was in prison. Obviously you're very, you're very much made aware of, of your status, um, amongst, uh, volunteers who come in officers, um, pretty much anybody who's not, uh, incarcerated, you know, that you are less than you feel that, right. It is very dehumanizing to be in prison. And I'm not saying that somebody come to you every day and say, you know, oh, you're less than human. But when they refer to you more by your number or your cell number than your name, that is dehumanizing. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, just, you know, the ways that they can they will uh, berate you or, or, or maybe not me directly because I never put myself in that position. But you see the way they talk to so many other people guys who are locked up you see the way they treat them at, in visiting when their families are there you see the way they treat their families coming in and so it, it is it is a very dehumanizing experience and i had to like mentally combat that and i know this is far away from what we were talking about but it just it's but but this is what goes into one's um kind of um uh how they come to see themselves inside and then you have to change that that narrative about yourself when you get out because now you're on equal footing with everybody out here. And internally, I didn't feel that I was. I literally didn't feel that I was. And I talked to my, my family and friends about that. And I'm like, man, like I'm having to, I'm finding myself having to remind myself that I'm I'm on equal footing with people. I don't have to take a back seat or kind of, you know, uh, uh, not be as, as vocal, you know, because I'm worried about a ramification if I say the wrong thing. It's like, well, no, I'm free now. 
And so that was, that was a challenge yeah. for sure. But uh, you know, and you said this is, this is a different a thing, but it's not, it's not because it's not just on the inside where you are being served that identity. But for those of us on the outside who have very little or no involvement with the criminal legal system, we're being told that about people who are incarcerated right. or people who are arrested. You know, it is so um, stigmatizing to have an arrest, to have a visit from a police officer to your door. Um, you know, there are so many ways in our society where even after serving your sentence, you don't have the rights of other people right. or you don't have the respect of other people. Um, you don't have the voice that, you know, a, a voice that's as valued as other people's voice. Um, and particularly when we consider race and the people who are incarcerated in this country um, versus the people who aren't, like it's just, it compounds as far as the, um, I don't know, the way that it affects how we're able to show up both socially in society, but also in the workplace. And so it is no surprise to me hearing you say these things because, um, yeah, I mean, obviously people don't, people don't even hire people who have criminal histories. People don't even hire people who have arrests. Arrest right. is not a criminal history. You know, people don't rent to people who have arrests or who have criminal, you know, past criminal involvement. Um, and so it... I think for those who are listening to this, who don't have experience working um, or don't have any lived experience with involvement in the criminal legal system, uh, it's so important for us to check ourselves there uh, mm -hmm. with, with the bias that we are being served. Like that is just how we operate in this society is that essentially like prison is the worst place where you can go. And if you're there, you're there for a reason. If you're there, you're bad and you're never redeemed. Um, and so like needing to make sure that we stop ourselves from continuing to participate in that narrative. Mm -hmm. um, if that's truly what we, like if we don't believe that, then we need to interrupt that bias that, that we have. Um, yeah. So I'm, I'm, you know, I, I think it's very much related. I think that's why some of these these conversations are so important is because with imposter syndrome in general, you know, I believe that so much of the doubt that we have in ourselves is society related. Mm -hmm. And particularly when race is concerned, I believe that imposter syndrome is a white supremacist mm -hmm. ideal. Um, it's, a, it's a white supremacist narrative. Um, and so... I, you know, I'm glad that you and others, you know, when we're able to work through this, I think it's so important um, because it's not you, right. you know, at, at this point, it's not you. Uh, the reason why you're wondering if you deserve to be paid this much is because for 17 and a half years, you were paid at tops $78 a month. Right. You know, the reason why, I don't know if, I, I hear some people um, have a hard time, and I'm this way sometimes for no reason, but if I address you formally, you know, I, I've i talked to people who were like, that makes me feel real uncomfortable because like I've done nothing to deserve that formality. Right. And I'm like, well, nobody has. We just exist. <laughs> right. We exist. That's and enough. so we're called. Yeah. Right. Like we exist and so we're called our names. Right. Like that's actually just what we deserve. Uh, or to be called a Mr. or Mrs. if that's what you want to be called, you know? Yeah. So anyway, I went on a little rant. Go yeah, ahead, continue. No, <laughs> you're right. You're absolutely right. Um, so yes. Uh, so now, so just just two little over two months ago, I was um, promoted to director of cultural engagement, which puts me in a senior management position. And so now, you know, we have, you know, leadership meetings and, um, you know, other, other meet, I mean, I'm in meetings almost every day. Um, and with that obviously came a significant raise. Um, I now supervise a team 
Um, you know, so it, it's really elevated my 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 status um, and and level of responsibility and and just everything. And it's it, it, and it's still like I'm having because it made me go back to like, dude, two and a half years ago you were incarcerated. Like now you're a director. Like is like how did you how did you make this happen? Like are you are you fit? Frankly. Like, and, and mm. but on, on one level, like, I know I put in the work. I know that my drive and passion and what I've been able to do thus far is what they saw. And they wanted to reward that. And they're like, well, this dude's more than just a call counselor. Like he can do, he can do more for this company than, than just that. Um, so I know that on one hand, but it's still like, I've never had anything. I've never been in any position remotely close to this. And I'm still only two and a half years release from prison where I was, you know, made to feel, you know, this big. Mm -hmm, and so just mm -hmm. accepting, like, I still have to accept that I do deserve it. And I even say that kind of like, uh, uh, like, do, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, even as I say it there, like, why did I, why did I say it kind of, you know, submissively, right? <laughs> Instead of like, you know, affirmatively, right? Mm -hmm. And so again, it's just, it, it's I, I, like, I have to, and it's, it's, it's a, I'm not going to say it's a constant thing um, because I'm getting more comfortable in this role, but mm -hmm. I do have to remind myself when I'm in these meetings with all these other directors and, 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 you know, uh, chief officers. And I'm like, wow, like I'm in this meeting too. And, and I am frankly, the only black face again, I don't, you know, I don't I've always felt supported by by this organization, right? Mm -hmm. But when I'm in those spaces, I'm keenly aware that I'm the only black face. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And so, yeah. you know, we and so we can we can be a little uncomfortable or we feel like we have to like we have to pronounce all of our INGs and you know, we have to we have to show up and we like we can't make a mistake because right? Because we're like we're like yeah. represent we don't just represent ourselves. Like we right. don't just represent ourselves. And 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 I wish I had the luxury of just representing my individual self, right? But as Black folks, especially Black folks who who reach certain, uh, 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 you know, statuses in, in life, like we know that you know, people pe people look look up to us. They 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 look at us to represent you know represent the voice that they don't have. Like we know that we're not just in that room by ourselves. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? And mm -hmm. so um. And so I think just kind of maybe the added pressure of that makes us question if we're if we're up to the task, if we're good enough for it, if we can, you know, uh, do justice to this role and, and all mm -hmm. the, the 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 not just the, the the occupational responsibility we have, but the the social responsibility we have as well. Right. And so, yeah, there's there's a lot of um, there's a lot of internal dialogue going on with myself as I navigate this new space. Um, you know, and I think, I mean, I, I guess that's a normal thing coming out of prison after 17 and a half. Like, I don't know. Right. I mean, I, I mean, what am I comparing it to? I mean, I have no reference. I've never, this is the first time I've, I've done this. Right. So, right. <laughs> you know, yeah. um, and it just is what it is. Right. Like, I think that's, we talked about this a little bit earlier. Like this is just life. Right. That's happening in your life right now. And so who knows if it's normal or not normal, but it's what you're feeling. It so, is. Um, to me, it seems totally reasonable. Um, so, you know, if that's worth anything. Um, <laughs> well, yeah, because, <laughs> it, think... well, yeah, because I, I think these, these conversations need to be normalized. Right. When mm -hmm. people have these feelings, because a lot of people, a lot of people might think that, oh, well, I, you know, maybe I shouldn't feel this way or, you know, does this make me. And so I think if the more we're able to give voice to it and to let people know that other people are might have these same struggles professionals have these same struggles no matter what status in life you are like we black people have it. so the more you know that you're not alone i think that gives you um that gives you some strength hopefully it gives mm -hmm. you some encouragement right mm -hmm. um and so then it kind of loses its power yeah i think so i think um it is the 
you know, gaslighting is such a, a hot topic word right now. And I, I use it a lot because I feel it a lot. Um, and it's something that I do to myself, but that I also feel um, being done to me. And I think, like you said, the more that we discuss, the more that we share what our experiences are and realize that we're not unique in our experiences, the harder it will be for us to continue to gaslight ourselves or for others to gaslight ourselves around the, I don't know, non-normativity. I don't think that's a word, but you know, the, the uniqueness of, right, right, of our experience. Like, um, because I'm sure people listening to you, and matter of fact, what you said, even about making money, like the amount of money that you made, I've heard one of my white male friends say these exact words, and he is someone who is coming from a blue collar working class family who in his adulthood is making more than his parents ever made. Mm -hmm. And he feels the imposter syndrome around the fact that like he shouldn't be making that much money. He's not worth that much. Like what does he do with all Like he has all these feelings around right. this money that he's, that he's making. Um, and, you know, I just think so many more of us have these these thoughts and these realities than we know simply because it's not really okay for us to talk about it. Like even discussing, you know, self-doubt can sometimes be, um, you know, in this competitive capitalist society, it's, you know, not, not rewarded. It's not something like, no, if, if I'm hiring you, like nobody wants I don't want to hire somebody who I know has self doubt to do anything. Right. <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. I need you to be supremely to... confident. I need right. you to be supremely assertive, right? All the time, be on point. Like, and that's just not realistic. But mm -hmm. like you said, in this, in this particular society, um, that's what's rewarded, right? Mm -hmm. That's what, and that's what, you know, people, people, people strive to be like those people, but really those people are putting up a facade because nobody is supremely confident 100% of the time. They're just yeah. not. Yeah. And I think we really find our power when we find how to be true with ourselves and authentic with ourselves and embrace our full selves. Um, and that does not mean staying at the self-doubt. What that means is finding a way to overcome it, finding a mantra, finding an affirmation, finding um, a specific type of exercise or a music or whatever the tool is going to be to get us out of that feeling and not to push it down and pretend like it's not there, but just to kind of, um, what's the word that I, like caress it, like we would a child who's scared, like just kind of support ourselves through the feeling until we get to the other side and do the damn thing, That's right. you know, that we're going to do because we know how to, you know, we're going to do it and it's going to be great. We just have to get ourselves, like walk ourselves through it um, using whatever the tools are that work for us. Um, and I think that's how like we root ourselves in our power is knowing what it is that's going to get us through knowing ourselves well enough to know that this is the feeling that I'm feeling. This is the emotion that I'm feeling. This is the the somatic, the, the body sensation that I'm feeling. And these are the things that I need to do to take care of myself so that when it's time, I can show up as fully as I need to or so that I can rest right. because maybe right now what I really just need is rest. Um, yeah. You know? Yeah, one 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 thousand percent. And again, it's it's you know, again, that acceptance that that these things are gonna happen, these feelings are gonna come up. Um, but what am I gonna do to take care of myself through these feelings? Mm. Right. The goal is not to never have the feelings, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm, that's right. that's that's not realistic. The goal right. is to is is to, like you said, to 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 recognize when you know when they're coming on and, and where they're coming from. And then how to properly respond to take care of yourself through that and get you, you know, get to a better place. That's, I mean, that's, you know, that's the sweet spot. Yeah. So I want to ask you, um, as we wrap up, what, for other people who have had some kind of criminal legal system involvement or institutionalization or other thing, 
Um, and they are now in the workforce and dealing with the self-doubt or the imposter syndrome or the I'm not deserving because two and a half years ago I was in prison. What are the things that you do today to walk yourself through those feelings so that tomorrow on Monday morning when it's time to show up for the job, you're showing up in the best way that you can? Absolutely. What do you how do you deal with it? What do you do? Yeah. So I have a huge um, self-care program. I know this is cliche, but I mean, for me, it's, it's what it's what helps me to kind of decompress if if I'm struggling. Right. So I, I mm -hmm. have a workout gym in my basement. I do that. I go for walks in a beautiful park by my house. Um, you know, I, I, I do some physical I do some physical some physical stuff mm -hmm. to kind of, you know, uh, relieve that tension. I also remind myself and, you know, positive self-talk is like it's so critical, especially when we have um, internalized so many negative messages from others around us about ourselves. They kind of mm -hmm. help to shape our self-concept, which has a direct impact on our self-esteem. So I think we have to counter those negative narratives about ourselves. And so I think that one of the biggest ways for me, and I hope this will help somebody else, is to like whatever position you are in to remind yourself that you did not get there by accident. Mm. Nobody, nobody is doing you a favor by giving you the job. Like you absolutely earned every single ounce of that. You did. You yeah. did the work. You got the education. You got the certification. You got whatever the experience to put you in that position. So don't feel guilty about that. Don't feel that, 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 that you're not deserving of that or worthy of that. You earned that. You did that. That didn't happen by accident. It didn't fall into your lap. And it's important you remind yourself of that. Wow. Thank you. Um, yep. <laughs> yep. Yeah. That's And it's so true. Like, sometimes we don't give ourselves credit for the work that we did. Um, right. And even hearing you talk, it's like, well, shit, you the best person for the job. You done spent 17 and a half years not getting caught up in everything that this country, this state, this system wants you to get caught up in That's because right. they don't want you to exit the criminal legal system. Right. So like the resilience and the, you know, it's just we have to start giving ourselves all the credit where we're due and we are due the credit. That's right. Um, absolutely. Thank you so much for this conversation, Martin. Where can folks find you if they want to talk more? Absolutely. Well, again, thank you so much for having me. This was incredible. Um, uh, just the topic. I've never talked about this topic uh, publicly. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to do mm -hmm. that. Um, I think the easiest way I'm only on one social media platform, which is Instagram. So it's at Martin L Lockett with two T's. And then my website is martinlockett.com. Awesome. Thank you. I, I hope that people who are in similar circumstances or who aren't, um, you know, really feel seen by this conversation. I think these conversations are so important. Um, and it's, you know, it really, I think, helps us see the humanity in each other. Um, so I'm just really, again, appreciative at your willingness to talk about it and your vulnerability. Thank you so much. It was totally my pleasure, Whitney. Thanks so much for joining me for this conversation. I hope that you got as much out of it as I did. Feel free to continue the conversation with us over on Facebook at the Imposterix Podcast Validating Space. We welcome all, and it's a space for us to validate each other as we work through work, race, and imposter syndrome. You can find out more about me or about the podcast at www.imposterixpodcast.com. And don't forget to follow me on Instagram at Podcast. Until next time, be validated.